Hello, uh, my name is Pablo Picato, and I'm here to introduce the speakers for this event in celebration of Pamela Smith's work. Very glad to be here. Um, so I'll start just giving you a brief presentation about the speakers, and I'll let them, uh, well, first Pamela will talk about the book, and then they will comment on it, on it and um, and hopefully we'll have some time for, for your questions, okay? Uh, so let me start. On, on that side of the table, um, Deborah Trump uh, is Associate Professor and Chair of Academic Programs and Coordinator for History and Theory of Museums at Bard Graduate Center. Um, her research and teaching include early modern European cultural history, history of theory of museums, uh, culinary history, and history of the book. Um, and she's interested in exploring the relationship between the objects of daily life, uh, including the arts of kitchen and table, and the dissemination of both learned and practical knowledge through books and prints. Uh, um, two publications I want to mention is Staging the Table in Europe, 1500 to 1800, and another book, Food and Knowledge in Renaissance Italy, Bartolomeo Scapis, Paper Kitchens. Thank you for coming. Um, then uh, I will, uh, also in the same order, Caroline Banyum, who uh, is a um, former Columbia faculty uh, and uh, also formerly from the Institute of Advanced Study. Um, you probably know about her more than I do, and, uh, you know, all of us have, you know, know of her books. Uh, I, I can mention... Um, Holy Feast and Holy Fast, the religious significance of food for medieval women. Uh, also, Wonderful Blood, Theology and Practice in Late Medieval Northern Germany and Beyond. Um, and her work has, has been very important uh, to understand uh, not, not only medieval studies, uh, but devotional practices uh, the use of objects in the 15th and 16th centuries. Um, and I will read, she's currently exploring the paradox of Catholic survivals, including the survival of women's monasticism in Protestant Germany. Next is my colleague uh, from the Department of History at Columbia, Caterina Pizzigoni. Um, she specializes in the history of colonial Latin America, and her interests include indigenous uh, populations, sources in Nahuatl, the indigenous language of uh, Central Mexico, or one of the indigenous languages, uh, social history, household and material culture. And um, she is author, among other titles, of The Life Within, Society in Mexico's Toluca Valley, 1650 to 1800, and The Testaments of Toluca, um, uh, a translation and introduction to 18th century testaments in Nahuatl um, from uh, Mexico. And finally, I just want to say a few words about Pamela, uh, also our dear colleague in the Department of History. Um, um, she specializes in European history and the history of science. And um, she's interested in uh, modern Europe and the scientific revolution particularly with attention to craft knowledge and historical techniques. We'll, we'll talk about that today. She is one of those historians that really is able to collaborate with people and create teams and, and, and not only co-author things, but engage people in, in, in collaborations that go beyond, you know, editing something or, you know, it's, it's really a model for all of us because she is also crossing the borders of, of the discipline and in, and collaborating in meaningful ways with people in, in I won't say only other departments, or other you know fields of knowledge, right? Uh, not only other sciences, but other ways to do things, you know. So um, you know, I can talk a lot about her books. I mean, the list is long, so I I won't go over uh, all of them. Uh, but it's a her project, um, uh, the making a knowing project, you know has uh, you know brought people into a lab if you want uh to 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 do history which is something that we 
you know, we wish we could do more, right? Uh, but we need labs. Yeah, <laughs> I guess it's not so easy. Um, um, the book that we're discussing today received the, the prize from the American Historical Association, the George L. Moose Prize for the most distinguished book in, on the intellectual and cultural history of Europe since 1500. And I'll just mention a couple of, of titles. The Body of the Artisan, Art and Experience in the Scientific Revolution, um, the edition of Entangle, it, Itineraries, Materials, Practices, Materials, Practices, and Knowledges across Eurasia. And she, you know, as you can see in the book, she's thought about this beyond, you know, the, the realm of Europe. Um, and uh, a project that came out of the the, the making and knowing uh, plan was Secrets of Craft and Nature in Renaissance France, a digital critical edition of manuscript FR 640 uh, that was published uh, three years ago. So um, we'll go, I think we have a, um, we'll start with Pamela introducing the book and then Katharina, Caroline and Deborah, and then Ka Pamela again to, to respond and then we'll open the question. Thank you. Well, thank you so much, Pablo. I really appreciate that generous introduction. And thank you to all my friends and colleagues who um, agreed to participate. I really appreciate it. And I'm humbled that you were eager to do so. I also want to thank the um, Heyman Center and ISERP, especially Lindsay Schramm and Le Leah Benke, and of course, Eileen Galuli also. To introduce the book, I want to parse this title from lived experience to the written word, reconstructing practical knowledge in the early modern world. Um, so this book began in um, what I felt I didn't articulate or didn't really understand when I wrote the book that seemed like it came not very long ago, but actually it was 20 years ago, um, The Body of the Artisan. And in that book, I um, didn't, you know, I, sh I think that it showed that early modern European artisans made novel claims about their knowledge of nature in their artworks. And it showed that um, they um, argued for and valued um, their knowledge. And, but I wasn't really satisfied with my understanding of the behavior of natural materials and the real kind of details of the skilled practices um, by which uh, craftspeople produced objects. And I didn't really know how to go about getting that knowledge. Um, so I turned first to books, you know, as <laughs> intellectual and cultural historian of science. Um, I, by, I started reading collections of recipes, instructions, so-called how-to books um, that had some relationship to the processes I was interested in at that time, which was metalworking. Um, so, and there's a history behind these books. From about 1400, many types of craftspeople began to write down their techniques. There were many diverse types of authors and practitioners, mining books, distilling books, horse doctoring, dance masters, and many, many others um, who began publishing from about 1400 and the kind of momentum built for these kinds of books. Um, I read these books, and but they're full of recipes, instructions, I didn't know what I was looking for and I didn't know what to pay attention to. And where was the knowledge in all this? What was this knowledge? Besides which um, words, especially ones fixed in print are not very effective for convey conveying embodied um, knowledge and techniques. And just think about, you know, how did you learn to ride a bike, right? You can't learn to ride it by reading a book. <laughs> or by being, <laughs> reading a how-to book. Um, so, you know, artisans who were writers, like Benvenuto Cellini, who were also authors, also commented on this. So, again, what was this knowledge that was so ineffable to these, um, to these uh, craftspeople? And an even more burning question was, okay, if it's not very good at conveying knowledge, um, why do it? Why write it down? Um, so answering those questions gave me um, the title from lived experience to the written word, reconstructing practical knowledge, as I eventually came to call that experiential knowledge 
um, that was so difficult to put into words. So my story in this book is a about a particular type of knowledge, but I also realized, I mean, I had to realize this, that it was also a story about words and texts as much as it was a story about materials, objects, and bodies. Um, so why would artisans write down their knowledge? And the answer to that question is, of course, I'm a historian, complex. Um, and uh, why would they write down their techniques? Um, so this answer to this question has many different kinds of facets, but one has to do with the greater literacy and self-consciousness of artisans like this sculptor from the 1490s, who included this over life-size realistic statue of himself at the base of this remarkable, you know, many tens of feet high um, sacrament house sculpture that he created in a Nuremberg church. Another part of the answer was a celebration and valorization of practical knowledge and the artisans who practiced it, in some cases um, related to cities in which they lived and were known for these um, objects, um, as such as this one, which um, from 1568, which portrayed craftspeople as diligent, industrious, and importantly, a central pillar of social order. And finally, one of the answers was printers, entrepreneurial printers, you know, getting started in the, um, you know, 70 years before the 1520s. Um, and some of these how-to texts were actually compiled and commissioned by entrepreneurial printers who are kind of a group between scholars and craftspeople. Um, they experimented with their new um, practice of printing, as you can see this wonderful frontispiece um, for a, a, a model book. Um, and uh, they also emphasized the new capabilities of their craft, lots of images, for example. Um, so, uh, these books turned out to be bestsellers for the printers. It was a good investment that they made. Um, and uh, with this is a single book. Well, supposedly it's by a pseudonymous author. It is supposedly a single um, you know, text that was translated into many different languages, went through a huge number of editions in a very short time. But actually each of these books is different in each language because the printers were busy compiling new and improved knowledge. Um, and they called it new and improved often. So um, who read all these books, right? So there were lots of them. So the next question was who read them all? And what I show in the book is that these texts were part of a larger culture, culture of interest in practical knowledge and the making of things, and part of a worldwide circulation of objects, which accounts for the early, in the early modern world of my title. Um, and evidence for that larger culture of interest can be seen from this detail, in this detail of this painting, um, which you can see uh, perhaps all of the different kinds of industry activities, um, handwork that's going on, and all of these objects that are in the foreground <clears throat> produced by them. So so much for books and their readers, but what of that ineffable knowledge held, held by craftspeople that had confused me so much? Um, I realized that I must, as the intellectual reformer um, para, known as Paracelsus urged, hasten to experience. I'm gonna read this text because it's so great. Um, it says everything. For who could be taught the knowledge of experience from paper? Since paper has the property to produce lazy and sleepy people who are haughty and learn to persuade them things and to persuade themselves and to fly without wings. Therefore, the most fundamental thing is to hasten to experience. Um, so I began following conservators around first at the Getty and the um, Victoria and Albert Museums, and I eventually took their advice to take hands on courses on historical techniques. There I am at a much younger age. And I then worked with silversmith and conservator Tony Benches at the Rijksmuseum to reconstruct techniques of life casting. And that's the reconstructing practical knowledge part of the title. Um, I, uh, the, the life casting is was especially represented in this manuscript, this remarkable manuscript um, that contained very detailed instructions um, and accounts of life casting of all kinds of animals and plants. Um, this anonymous late 16th century French manuscript 
um, contains not just a large portion on life casting and casting metals of all kinds, um, but also all kinds of notes, instructions, observations on different trades, processes, techniques. It's a mishmash and it's very confusing. There's a lot left out. There are a lot, there's a lot that is um, repetitive, um, but it was fascinating. And I founded the Making Knowing Project and all work on the book ceased for, for about um, seven years or more, actually. Um, <clears throat> so I wanted to investigate from 2014 on I, with the Making Knowing Project, this gigantic collaborative effort, which was uh, just wonderful. Um, uh, I wanted to really reconstruct the processes in this text so I could understand, are they you know, processes that were actually in use at that time. Um, is it even understandable? Is it possible to reconstruct? Is it really even a good tool for historians? You know, like, does it, should we even consider it as part of a tool for historians? Um, and so we worked very hard and um, for almost seven years. And then in February, 2020, that very, um, momentous moment, uh, we uh, released the first, um, uh, we published the first release of Secrets of Craft and Nature in Renaissance France, this digital critical edition and English translation. Um, and if you've read the book, you'll, um, this printed book, not this digital one, um, you'll realize that the last two chapters of the book um, really rely on a lot of that collaborative work, also of students. Um, and uh, it was, you know, I just realized so much through um, through uh, working on that. And I really hope that you'll want to explore this edition. Um, it not only it contains the whole you know, transcription, translation, but also 130 or more essays um, that treat techniques, reconstructions, culture, you know, reflections on how to, um, uh, reconstruction is a useful technique for historians. Um, and uh, in many ways, detail, uh, in give much greater detail about some of the themes that I cover in From Lived Experience. Um, so that's the title of the book, From Lived Experience to the Written Word. Um, so I'm almost finished. But I did want to just say that um, we're still working on secrets of craft in nature. We are um, putting together a research and teaching companion. Um, it's now on the sandbox. We're also creating a publication tool so you can, in the classroom, make have students make your own edition based on the feature set of this um, of this uh, of the edition that we have now, so stay tuned. Um, and I also um, will just um, say that I've started this new project, in which really is like a continuation. I suddenly had this realization. Well, I didn't really talk all that much about how, in the um, you know the kind of human nature relationship of this particular moment of making things. Um, and uh, I think I should stop now, but if you want to ask me about what this is about, <laughs> I will probably go on and on. Um, but I do want to just um, acknowledge and um, say how privileged I was to work with so many people. And these photos are just a few of the people I worked with um, in the Making Knowing Project, and thus also in terms of having the realizations that I did in this book. And I'm just so grateful to all of the museum staff, supporters, and especially the many, many students who had a hand in the Making Knowing Project. Okay, that's it. Now, Katerina. Um, okay, so uh, thank you, Pamela. It was wonderful to also hear you talk about the book. I also wanted to thank you for inviting me to comment on the work and thank the Hyman Center and all the co-panelists and all of you for being here today. Um, I always find your work very thought-provoking, uh, Pamela. We have a conversation over the years and, and I always learn a great deal from it. What I thought I might try to do today is um, sharing with you a few thoughts I have coming to it from the perspective of somebody who does early Latin American history and indigenous history in particular. Um, so with this perspective in mind, I wanted to focus on four words that I take out of your books. There are many, but four words that I take out of your books as a 
way for me to think about it. Writing, making, imitating, and then environment to conclude. Um, writing, you already you know, introduced a very uh, effectively to the paradox that the book acknowledges um, that there are author practitioners that they never thought of writing anything down, and at some point they decide to do so. Um, and you say, Pamela, I quote from uh, from your book, um, they did not need writing to produce things and make knowledge, but nevertheless they decided to do so, to argue for a new place in the hierarchy of knowledge. Um, I consider in particular this very powerful thing, it's a very powerful quotation that you give us of a citizen of Cologne, Cologne you say Köln, I don't know, yes, <laughs> that is on page 13 of your book. And I just want to read an, a little bit of that. When it's a quotation from him. And he says, I hope that nobody will reproach me for writing so much about simple folks, sisters, brothers, friends, neighbors, citizens, peasants, journeymen, domestic, plain, and childish things, and about myself. But who will do it but for me, right? And uh, that resonated so much with the um, introduction uh, of a, a manuscript that I know and has been published coming from the Warochiri people of the uh, Peruvian Andes. Uh, this comes from the beginning of the 16th century. The manuscript uh, closes the 16th century, if you want. And that's what these indigenous writers are saying. If the ancestors of the people called Indians had known writing in earlier times, then the lives they lived would not have faded from view until now. As the mighty past of the Spanish Viracochas, the way they call the, the, the deities, is visible to us now, so too would theirs be. Right? So our across this early modern world, there's been a lot of reflection from different points of view about the importance of writing, the inescapable importance of writing, and yet, you know, uh, not, that not being satisfying. So I, I think that here we have very interesting parallels, of course, is a reminder of the need to do so according to these different artisan practitioners or indigenous people not to have their past forgotten or not being relevant. And yet I think they do it in a way that, that make us understand that there is something else beyond that, right? That isn't insatisfactory. Um, and so that our attention should go beyond what is considered to be scientific enough or objective enough or written down enough in a way that everybody will read. And so I think that by doing so, the artisans and the indigenous writers uh, make us understand that they adopted some Western canons to communicate to us and with us, but they felt a little bit kind of forced to do that and it's still insatisfactory. So we need to go beyond that. And that brings me to my second term, making. Going beyond writing in your work, yes, it means Let's have a look at other kind of your know, oral practices or objects that historians have been doing for quite some time, uh, wonderfully, I think. But is going beyond that. Uh, through your book, we understand that we need to be paying attention not only to the objects, but to the processes of making, right? So the making itself, how we get there. And that alights our uh, knowledge or intelligence don't come only through the work of the mind, as you say, but well, from the work of the hand. And I appreciate that that much. I was not thinking about the processes before reading your book. I mean, I've known your work, but when you read it, you really, it's one message that I take out very powerfully. And here as well, I think that indigenous history is a powerful reminder of that. For example, uh, with the attention paid to the ways indigenous um, pot makers inscribe their body in the uh, ceramics they produce. And there's a way to get, you know, not to the name of the authors many times, but to understand the techniques better because they do that if you pay attention to the processes of making and not just to the outcome of what they produce. Um, which brings me then to my third ter uh, term. So we've done writing, making, imitating. Going beyond writing also applies to another aspect of the book that I thought was really thought provoking, the value of training the attention by observation and imitation. So learning by appren apprenticeship, a term I can never pronounce in English, so sorry about that. Um, <laughs> which has two essential elements in Pamela's words, humility. So you learn by following the examples of others and by starting from the basics and practicing and practicing and practicing again. And then collective enterprise, or the, I call it collective enterprise, sorry. You cannot learn alone by as part of an interacting group. Again, I think the imitation and community are actually central concepts in indigenous processes of knowledge that have often been kind of disregarded as not intellectual enough. And so I, here as well, I find very many parallels. And then I conclude in my last term, environment. So part of the practical knowledge at the core of the book 
is the idea of the of learning to attend and understand matter, the materials, right? And so experience it, immerse yourself in it with your body, with your senses. And this calls for a different relation with the environment, not the division nature culture, not the division human non-human, uh, that are part of our normal way of general way of understanding knowledge and science. And so the early modern words and indigenous words within them are a powerful reminder of this, that we are wired that way, but we shouldn't necessarily be wired in this kind of dichotomies. And so I conclude my remarks by saying that, and as a summary, going beyond, going beyond words, focusing on the processes of making, observing and imitating with humility and in symbiosis with the environment and the communities. From a point of view, somebody who does indigenous history, there are so many references that I'm so happy to read your work and it gives me a lot to be thought of, uh, to, to, to think of, but I think it goes well beyond that. I think that Pamela's book is giving us a revolutionary message in a way, a way to think about knowledge that is different from what we normally hear in our universities, in our educational systems, where the emphasis is always on the talented, the genius individuals and the pedigree of knowledge. So for this Pamela, more than anything else, thank you so very much. Um, I have questions, but I leave it first for the, uh, the audience and then otherwise I'll ask you my couple of questions at the end. <laughs> I think I'm supposed to use this. Yeah, yeah. Okay. okay. Well, first of all, to say this is just a wonderful book, uh, which gave me great happiness in reading. And uh, I agree with everything uh, that uh, Catherine just said about uh, the inspiration uh, that it provides. I want to focus on two aspects of Pamela's claims. First, that we have new kinds of sources emerging in large numbers after 1400, that these manuals that show a hands-on approach to nature. And second, her claim that we have to look beyond text to understand the approach of these texts, which has, of course, led to the making and knowing laboratory. So I took as my task, really, the question whether is there any use for me as a medievalist um, of the kind of wonderful things that Pamela is doing in her book. Um, so first of all, to say that Pamela is right, that there is nothing in the Middle Ages that's exactly like what she studies. We do have things like Villard d'Encore's manual, which is an album of sketches. We have alchemical text, and they do occasionally contain actual recipes. We have a few works that discuss techniques, for example, uh, Theophilus, the metal worker, who Pamela talks about, who gives practical advice, and he may have been a metal worker, but then again, he may not have been uh, a metal worker. And we have herbals and some texts from midwives, uh, such as Hildegard of Bingen, Scalza et Cura, the Trotula that Monica Green uh, has worked on. But these are not mostly recipe books. And they're not mostly step-by-step -step craft books. And most importantly, they're not mostly by uh, practitioners. So except for the people who've dabbled in alchemy and um, have sometimes tried the recipes for uh, various motives, uh, nobody has really done medieval texts. So there's clearly nothing in the Middle Ages like Pamela's Michael of Rhodes, um, who died in 1445 and wrote about what he did in rowing and uh, navigation. He tries, as Pamela explains, to make his manual parallel to aristocratic notions of knowledge, but actually it's a handbook uh, for practical use. As I read, however, I found myself thinking, there's got to be some connection between what I study and this really remarkably new making and knowing way of exploring practical text. So what I want to claim, just as a, an experiment, is that we do find works in the Middle Ages like graphs manuals, for which doing is crucial to knowing. And we've quite recently had some historians who've begun to suggest doing as a historical technique. But, I don't laugh, I want to suggest that where we have this is in the area of religious practice, not what we would call art or handicraft or folk medicine. And that we've recently had scholars who do suggest that we should understand medieval works of advice about prayer and meditation, 
not as works of philosophy or theology, not as theoretical works, but as practical manuals, as how-to books, as recipe books for the inner life. Okay, what kind of thing am I talking about? First, I'm talking about the sort of text that were the first things that I ever worked on in my dissertation, works of advice for novices, that is for beginning monks and nuns. These were essentially religious how-to books, and they were just like Pamela's manuals in their organization. They're typically, uh, you know, typically not organized. They sort of wandered around uh, and included a good deal of practical experience. A more important example, recently two very different scholars, Invar Gravel in 2018 and Jamie Kreiner in 2023, have written about the absolute plethora of books in both East and West, in Syriac, Greek, and Latin, that are really how-to books about how to discipline the mind, to take practical steps to avoid distraction, even to avoid events that we would think of as psychotic, although they would have said demonic. These books give all sorts of accounts about how to pray, and meditate in ways that change what I would call the material of the self through experiment, through repetition, through work on the body that affects the mind, fasting, pain, changes of temperature. Uh, we would say work on the body that affects the mind, but they thought, how does the exterior affect the self as a kind of mind-body unity? Another example from a very different scholar, Rachel Fulton Brown, in Mary and the Art of Devotion in 2018, treats what a person does in prayer. So the art in the title of her book means exactly what Pamela means by art, the art of the artisan. That is a detailed recipe for what one does uh, in prayer. And then, of course, there's long been the study of manuals it really are how-to books about how to live that are typical of the so-called modern devotion of the 14th and 15th centuries that culminated in the 16th century in Ignatius Loyola's Spiritual Exercises, which is certainly a how-to book that requires to be done, acted, and tested, just like in Pamela's laboratory over and over again. So I'm suggesting that there's parallel in the Middle Ages of types of books, how-to books, although I, I'm considering religious how-to books. But what about the doing part, the making and knowing, or the knowing by making of Pamela's laboratory? Should we even try doing or making these sorts of books? And here, of course, lies the problem. First, one might say that the Jesuits do exactly this. The Jesuits do exactly what the students in Pamela's laboratory do. They do the steps exactly as they're written out in order to discern vocation. So we have people doing these manuals, but most of us are not going to become Jesuits. And I can't imagine sort of a laboratory at Columbia where people were doing all this that was turning on Jesuits. <laughs> Secondly, Rachel Fulton Brown has infuriated some medievalists by suggesting that the kind of devotion that she studies can be understood only by doing it. Now you can imagine the problem because it would seem to leave certain sorts of people who wouldn't want to do it out. But on the other hand, she has a real point can you understand all this devotional stuff if you don't, in fact, go through it? Reading about it as theory is not actually very interesting. Uh, and then third, of course, there are others who've tried to do the meditational practices of ancient monks or even of the modern devotion of the 14th and 15th centuries. But in the cases that we've had so far, uh, these efforts have tended to slip into psychoanalysis and become something really very different from the original how-to text, rather than producing the product as you do with your wonderful, you know, golden serpents from life, they've tended, if anything, to produce something that really gets very, very far away from uh, the manual. So my parallel to Pamela's achievements, quite incomplete, but three conclusions. 
First, her argument for the newness of craft manuals leads me to agree that there is nothing like her materials in the Middle Ages. Second, thinking about what she says about craft manuals leads me as a medievalist to see new things in and to take much more seriously a kind of medieval text, a whole range of manuals uh, that are often neglected. And finally, and most importantly, her method raises some profound questions about whether we can, as historians, understand any sort of manual from the past without something like her making and knowing project. But that raises for us very deep philosophical questions about historical knowledge and about how we can or can we really encounter the past. Great. Well, thank you. It's it's really wonderful to be here and to celebrate Pamela's book. I think I have the hardest task coming at the end of all of these incredibly thought-provoking and interesting, very short presentations. So I guess I'm going to talk a little bit more about the, the, the book and the Making and Knowing Project. Um, so I'd like to highlight the influence that Pamela's work has had on an emerging generation of students and scholars of the arts, of the sciences and material culture through the profoundly collaborative Making and Knowing Project, including several of our students at the Bard Graduate Center who've been part of the project through our consortium agreement or joined as postdoctoral fellows. As, as others have said, her project reunites science and the humanities in a way which mirrors the shared conceptual lexicon of these realms from the late medieval period into at least the 18th century. Her constant emphasis on the value of practice and experience for the formation of knowledge has been activated through the many seminars she's led together with an amazing cohort of chemists, art historians, conservators, conservation scientists, taxidermists, metal workers, glass blowers, and many other kinds of artisans, retrofitting a lab and sourcing or creating the obscure and often unlikely raw materials to enact hundreds of experiments roughly sketched at or hinted in the pages or in the margins of the manuscript 640. This practice is both research and a form of pedagogy that draws everyone along in the excitement of discovery making detectives and forensic archeologists out of students, many of whom have gone on to employ the methods they learned through the project seminars um, as professors or curators in the field. I'm in fact going to the Renaissance Society of America meeting in a couple of weeks in Chicago, and I'm speaking at a panel invited by one of the students who, who came through the BGC and then to making and knowing. So there's a, there's a, a next generation out there already, which, is, which is, must be very gratifying and it should be. Um, through the massively rich digital critical edition of the manuscript, we can sit in on years of seminars and laboratory sessions, watching fascinating videos of making molds of casts, dyes and pigments, fake gems, fish glue, imitation marble, counterfeit coral, dried flowers, buckram sausage, molded roses, powder for hourglasses, and millet bread to name just a few of the things that the student practitioners produced based on the recipes in this manuscript. This multimedia digital environment, which is available to the public, uh, is informed by state-of-the-art technologies that were themselves invaluable training for students in the digital humanities, which is, we all know, is a very important, rapidly expanding field in academia. Um, so uh, just to give you a brief taste of what research actually means, uh, I've cut and pasted a few of just a very few of the images from manuscript 640. Um, this is uh, some of the tools that are needed for molding. And you can see um, the the artist practitioner, craftsman practitioner has put the, there's a brush and different types of um, look like scalpels, a cup, um, and and the sort of the idea like this is get get your kind of mise en place together to before you start your experiment. Yeah, <laughs> the snake exactly. Yeah. Um, since, uh, as as Pamela said, about a third of the manuscript is for metal casting, and and so um, 
Pamela and her collaborators meticulously followed the directions to cast a variety of forms after studying first all of the existing life casts uh, from the period in museums and collections. Here, I can switch this. The manuscript includes lots of information um, about how to capture and kill the animals for the casts. And I'm, I was thinking of reading some, some of that, but I thought right before lunch, it might not be so appetizing. <laughs> but this is a lizard. And, and it's really, a, as, as Pamela points out, a form of natural history to the, the extent to which you have to know the animals to understand their habits and, and what, what makes them do certain things and how to, because you have to capture them and then kill them without destroying them because then you have to cast them. So that's an, that in and of itself demands an incredible amount of skill. So as, as I understand it, and this is, you know, all of your work, here's a lizard on a clay base and <laughs> okay. <laughs> but I love the detail of in this in this cast, um, a, a Yamnitzer cast of a of a lizard. You can see that tiny. I don't know if you can see it. This tiny little square um, thing where the pin was, and and I think that you probably wouldn't have um, seen that pin if you weren't trying to understand how it was made and to, and to look for it, and then to understand exactly where to put the pin in the lizard, in the reconstruction process. So it's this incredible combination of different types of ob observation and, and skills. Um, and then it, the next, the, these, the, this clay enclosure that you made for the, for the casting process, literally following exactly what is, what's in the manuscript. So not only what's happening, but also the form of it and the materials and what it looks like. And then um, the finished, piece here, which, um, and you have to pay special attention to the caption there, although the lizard cast is unsuccessful as a whole. And th that's a super important part of this project, as I understand it, is that it's trial and error, and not everything is going to work. And so you have to learn from all the mistakes and all the, all the times it didn't work, all the beautiful objects that we have in, in museums today are things that did work. So to sort of to go back and look at all of the um, what what would be thrown out the the wasters from the kiln and ceramics all of these are can tell you an incredible amount um, about the potential for learning. Um, in the final section of the book of the from lived experience, Pamela reflects on this experience of reconstructing practical knowledge, citing her ment one of her mentors, the um, Paracelsus, about the most fundamental thing is to hasten to experience again, and I think that. That if I don't know whether making a knowing made t-shirts and water bottles, but if if you had, that's what would have been on them, I think. Um, but as she outlines, these this three-pronged approach, reenactment, recreation, and remaking are empathic techniques to gain insight. And I'm going to quote here, not only into the material world of the past, but also into the mental world of the past. Employing reconstruction to practice what has been called the history of mentalities is a brilliant riff on the project of creating total history that was pioneered by the members of the Annal School beginning in the 1920s with the publication of the Annal d'Histoire Économique et Sociale, adding in an understanding of the material dimension to what has been a profoundly transformative notion of history that resides not in big political or diplomatic events, but in the social history of collective practices. Citing a range of historical precedents for empathy and reconstruction as historical method, Pamela notes that, quote, a jolt is needed to enable students to make an imaginative leap back into the past and take seriously the worldviews of earlier eras in order to better understand the historical formation of the knowledge system we know today as modern science. The chapter on reconstruction functions to contextualize the inspiration for the entire Making and Knowing project on a historical continuum that ranges from ancient science to contemporary chemistry. It also surveys recent or current parallel enterprises in academic settings that engage with object-based inquiry, making an incontestable case for its value as a method. At heart, one might say that reconstruction offers a path to understanding more traditional ways of cognition and coming to understand the world through one's own experience as countless generations must have done before the advent of instructions in the form of how-to books any written recipes or YouTube videos, all of which are addressed in the book. While most of us are familiar with the conservation of paintings and other works of art that go back to the original materials and techniques employed by artists or designers to repair masterpieces damaged through war or theft or simply by time, 
so that they can be returned to their pedestals and museums, thinking of these same methods as a form of research as an end in and of themselves is an imaginative undertaking that draws on the history of science and the history of art and craft in equal measure. Um, so I think I'm gonna just move on and um, just to close on another image from the um, digital, digital critical edition of a beautiful reconstruction of a life cast rose as a virtual bouquet to help celebrate Pamela's pathbreaking oh. achievement. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. Thank you so much. I am humbled and so gratified that you got the you got it. <laughs> I mean, that's that's nothing to say about, you know, your your capacities it's all about you never know as an author whether you know what you put out in the world is actually going to going to be understood or at least that's the way i feel so that was thank you thank you so much um so there were a couple of really wonderful um things that well everything you said was wonderful um and gives me such insights um i loved Katerina, your point about the inescapable necessity of writing, right? And still, you know, you think this is a book that will be discovered because it has a, I mean, will be read by people because it has a whole infrastructure around it. The digital edition, which is in many ways so much more than this book, because it's not in a written form, in a textual form, which is such a, has such power you know, it will, it, it's not discoverable. And that's a big problem with digital um, projects is discoverability and sustainability. So actually print on paper is still the most discoverable and sustainable at this point, you know, in our culture, because that's how we, because of those entrepreneurial printers in the 16th century, basically. Um, so yes, the inescapable necessity of writing. I mean, yeah. Um, and just a word about state-of-the-art technology. It's actually the oldest technology, digital technology that you can use because that is the most sustainable. So it's actually very simple. It's all open source and it's, um, and I hope it means that it will be sustainable in the long run. It needs very little maintenance. You know, your normal website, state-of-the-art website only lasts for a couple of years um, and needs constant updating. Um, so the your other point about education, I guess I become kind of a proselytizer now for um for the the potential of you know trying to insert hands-on work into a very text, you know, the textual regimen of the university. And um it's you know, it really as a historian of knowledge of science, it seems to me very important to make to give students some exposure to that. Um, to a different form of knowledge to make them appreciate many things, you know, also just handwork, which doesn't, you know, it, there are interesting things that happen in terms of experimental sciences and, and laboratories and so on. Um, but still, it's very important to understand um, the different forms of knowledge and how they are, um, how they've been uh, hierarch hierarchized or put into a hierarchy over um, a very, very long time. Um, and then it's interesting, Caroline, about Rachel Fulton Brown, because I, oh, many decades ago, probably, I heard a lecture by her when she was first starting her work on, um, I think, you know, what it felt like to um, get down on your knees and pray for several hours at a time and then walk on your knees along the church floor. Um, and um, that really struck a chord with me, partly because it was about reconstruction of embodied experience, which, you know, is what um, what this whole book is about. Um, but also because, you know, I realized at that point um, that the uh, and actually the 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 Devotio Moderna has a part in Body of the Artisan. So, you know, in terms of just also valorizing embodied experience. And you know, people talk a lot about the secrecy of artisans, the secrecy of craft. You know, that's usually um, about 
you can't really know how it's done unless you unless you can practice it. Um, but it's also a claim that artisans and practitioners make too, because it is it alludes to it gestures towards esoteric knowledge, which is religious knowledge, or is often um, you know part of religious um, knowledge, part of devotional practices. And um, so that secrecy, that idea of esoteric knowledge that's known in the body and shown on the body, like stigmata and so on, um, becomes a way to claim knowledge for artisans also. So yeah, I think the points that you made about, um, about uh, you know, what does it mean really to reconstruct religious knowledge? And I'll just say one more thing which is look at one search the edition for excellent for burns and you will see a burn salve recipe which is about a religious um ritual and as that stirring and saying the paternoster goes on um the your your substance which is basically an emulsion mayonnaise um uh expands by about five times it becomes inspirited and i think it is the materialization of spiritual practice in a very interesting way um and then uh uh deborah thank you <laughs> um yeah so you showed some of the products some of the failures some of the successes but the thing that was hard to keep in mind throughout the entire, you know, all of this work is that process is what we're aiming for. We're aiming to understand the process, not to think about the product. And that that, that is such an important point for education, for, um, you know, in our kind of like testing regime of the, you know, modern US and our university. Um, and it is, you know, the problem is, you know, look what's on the cover of this book, some of the products. And so, um, so that too is something that I think wor is worth, um, bears mentioning here that, you know, it, the, the, the way that one has to um, talk about you know, the, the way that we think is based on, I mean, in our culture is based on the product, thinking more about the product and showing, demonstrating by showing the success of the product than the process, because that's the hard part to put into words. So again, it's this, this problem of trying to put into words, trying to fix things that are processual, that are that are over, you know, embodied, that don't really fit into that kind of regime of seeing and knowing. Thank you, Pamela. We have about 15 minutes for questions. Uh, if you can um, state your name and, and then raise the question, comments, praise. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yes, questions from each other. Oh, yes, please do. Yeah. Oh, and actually, you had a couple of questions too, Catherine. Sure. Go ahead, Deborah. Are you sure? So, well, um, this is very, very quick. So, um, thank you, Pamela. Uh, so, I I mean, there would be many, but then I was, I pinned down two um, after going back and uh, checking all my notes. Um, one thing I was thinking, and you put it very nicely, is how um, starting from 1400 and also following current um, comments, I understand that's really something new that is happening with this um, writing down. And you say, you know, partly has to do, you, you give us all sorts of explanation, but, you know, it's a um, uh, city, it's kind of the urban development, more artisans mm -hmm. living together in cities, the mm -hmm. catering to an elite that wants, so all the reasons you put there. Mm -hmm. And then I was struck when I read uh, Michael of Rhodes, and thank you for mentioning that, uh, that actually you see in him like a personal drive, right? He wants to write down these techniques of navigation to beat the competition, right? So he thinks it's going yeah, to... Yeah. So I was thinking this uh, interesting combination between the, how do you call it in English, exogenous uh, factors around the yeah. uh, actor um, practitioners and their inner drive. Oh, yeah. And I was wondering how much of that you were able to see also in the anonymous um, 
you know, uh, author of your manuscript 640 that, you know, we, you don't know who he is, basically. So how much of that can come out of, you know, your work in terms of understanding him as an individual? I, I assume it's a him, it's yeah. a he, because they were mainly yes. men, right? Yeah. Um, yeah, I think you have to turn off yours. Um, yes. Uh, so yes, a he because of pronouns and um, references. Um, but uh, in terms of the inner drive, the ambitions, obviously, that is so obvious in this period. I mean, uh, that that salt cellar that I showed you by Benvenuto Cellini is, I mean, he is a perfect example of this. I mean, the 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 inner drive to to become seen as a practitioner of the liberal arts, those that are, you know, suitable to a free man rather than just a practitioner of the mechanical arts, right? That is the ambition that's driving them is, is a status. And also they're in competition because, um, you know, the, the, uh, the guilds already in the 16th century were being fragmented by and being, you know, worn away by the centralized um, governments, by the by the rulers of territories in Europe um, who, uh, you know, needed those artisans and artists for their own theater of state um, and were able to free them from the guild um, rules, like of how many apprentices they could have or things like that um, to work for them. And so, um, so that meant that they were in competition with each other. And you see that very clearly in places like Florence, where there is, in fact, I mean, the Medici make the Uffizi are the workshops um, of artisans that were brought in from all over Europe to work together and compete with each other. I mean, it was quite intentional. So, um, uh, so that's about the inner drive. Um, did you have another question that I could find? Instead. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, Sorry. That was, was yeah. Okay. That was very long answer. <laughs> so we should, we should move to the audience if the audience has questions. That's better. Anyway. Thanks so much. Yeah. Thanks, Pamela. Um, can everyone hear me? Um, I just, you know, I'm, I want to say I'm looking forward to reading the book. We're reading it in our class next week. So um, I'll have more to see then. But um, I have a couple of questions based on this really rich discussion and conversation so far. Um, and also, you know, this is a topic, obviously, you've been working on many years, we've been having conversations around this for a while. So um, I have like four or five questions, maybe, but you don't have to answer all of them. Obviously, I just kind of want to throw it out there. And then maybe we'll meet for coffee or something at a, another point. <laughs> um, but one question is about whether or not you have any kind of uh, thoughts on the relationship between practical knowledge as you're presenting it, and the idea of tacit knowledge, which is something that's kind of been important in the history of science, um, whether or not there's a Tacit knowledge, uh, tacit knowledge. Uh, so, you know, there's, there's, I'm wondering if there's maybe some kind of distinction there in terms of uh, thinking about practical knowledge and kind of hands on experiential, experiential knowledge that's maybe uh, more at an individual level and whether tacit knowledge uh, and its relationship to SSK is kind of more about uh, social roles. Uh, so, the, sort of the social function of knowledge. Uh, so, I just wonder if you had anything about that. The other is there's so much written on the history of the book, uh, and I was wondering whether or not you thought there was a connection between this early history of printing and, and manual culture in particular, and the history of, of the book kind of writ large. Um, the third question is really uh, about whether or not you see any role of, in, in terms of uh, kind of the interest, say, uh, interest in metallurgy and metals and certain materials uh, of uh, commerce and colonialism at this time and how that impacts the rise of material culture and that emphasis. And then maybe I'll just stop with the last one. I don't know if I, this time for the fifth, it's kind of connected to uh, Caroline's point about uh, matter and spirit, but I was thinking, uh, you know, I'll just kind of bundle the two together, the last two together. Uh, you know, uh, thinking about the history of the senses uh, and this kind of idea of uh, where the sort of virtue, you know, the um, kind of knowledge of virtues and kind of the ethics of, you know, uh, transforming the self, uh, you know, in terms of, again, uh, uh, handwork and so forth. Um, and I was wondering if there was anything in the manuals that you read that kind of emphasized certain senses, right? You know, like um, the, the importance of kind of tactile knowledge or visual knowledge or olfactory knowledge and whether or not, again, there's a lot of literature on history of the senses and embodied uh, knowledge. So I was wondering if you had thoughts on that and then whether or not that connected to uh, the question of matter and spirit, um, which is 
maybe a longer question, so I'm just going to leave that dangling like that and not get into it. <laughs> but thank you. Uh, thank you, Mara, so much. Um, I would love to get together and talk to you, uh, with you about all of these um, points. Um, yes, tacit knowledge is, um, I talk about various kinds of um, Pogliani and Harry Collins, I mean, various kinds of treatments of tacit knowledge. Um, you know, not all of this knowledge is tacit, obviously, meaning that you can't write it down. Um, uh, and and sometimes you can follow how-to books, you know, it's not as though it's Im absolutely impossible. Um, you know, I once did a kind of survey with students a long, long time ago about, you know, could do you think you could follow this? And like building a beehive, a, a early modern English text, uh, it seemed like that would be very possible. We didn't do it actually, but um, uh, so, so yes, so tacit knowledge is important for the analysis here. Um, I want to go to your um, point about the um, role of the interest in, say, metals and metallurgy and, um, you know, the extraction of um, colonialism. Um, and yes, I mean, you know, my the the project that I'm working on now, the the print of which I showed you um, to kind of introduce it, um, but then couldn't talk about it. Um, it's my my current kind of moving on from this, having realized that, um, you know, at the moment that this is happening, you know, German miners are going all over the world, basically, um, because they're sought after as metal workers. Um, and uh, how did their knowledge, how does craft knowledge contribute to that change as we see it now in human environment relationships in the 16th and 17th centuries. It's not so simple, you know, from my from my um, pro very preliminary work, um, but it is something that I feel like I have to deal with. And part of it is about the I the the enthusiasm for craft for um, for these techniques, for these how-to books, um, because those books were very formative in, as I said, the printers were saying new, improved, informing and an idea of the infinite progress of knowledge and of material life. You know, that's what we live with today. That's what kills us today in some ways, right? And um, so, so that seems to be really important to this moment, to the because the you know Francis Bacon says, look to the mechanical arts for the um, for how we can change the world. You know, it, that's paraphrasing, obviously, but he is very much invested in the progress of the mechanical arts. So, um, so it is this moment, and although I kind of. I allude to it. I don't really deal with it in this book. Um, and that's what I'm doing now. Um, so yes, it is really bound up with that. I'm, I'm not sure exactly whether there's a gigantic change at that point, um, but it is an interest, really interesting question. Thank you. Um, thank you so much. It's been such a wonderful panel and it's, uh, I'm also looking forward to reading the book. Um, you know, one of the things that struck me as I was listening, that one of the things that, of course, um, you you made so clearly the difference between writing and making, and your incredible insistence on the fact that you have to learn on how these processes uh, were being, how the things were being made, right, the process to enter it. But as I was hearing you talking, what struck me is it's not just that the processes that you are recreating, but the sort of social structures and community organization that goes with those practices, right? Um, we don't talk about apprenticeship, but you worked, you yourself was an apprentice and you you had students, right? They were your apprenticeship. So I was thinking about how how much, how important it is, it seems to me that for this making part, it was collaborative, that there were a lot of people, um, especially if we think about how much we can contrast it with writing as we think writing is such as individualistic practice, even though I don't think it is, but but at least in the in kind of, we imagine it to be something that we do alone as opposed to making that requires this much more collaborative work. Kind of want to just to reflect a little bit more about the kind of this tension that 
uh, not just between the writing and the making, but the kind of community and social uh, structure that goes with it. To a couple of questions that came up from Katarina, also from Marwa. I mean, to, to what extent are are you speaking of a Western experience? Um, it, I mean, it's, it, as we go on, it sounds like that. Um, Katarina, I wasn't quite sure if you were implying that there was a similarity or what happens when there's not. But I guess, were you then suppose that this would ha be happening in, in the kingdom of Burma in the same period, or goodness knows in China, Japan, where you have, I mean, just to say, suggest, where we know there's incredibly advanced craft cultures, or would there be a different, because, because you're all, you know, you hear the market, the guild, the individual, you hear all those words, which usually we associate with the universal West as a, you know, Okay, those seem kind of different questions. So <laughs> I will, that's a really important question, Vicky, but I'm going to um, uh, go to Alma's first. Um, yes, I mean, the apprenticeship, I, you know, none of us became experts. We, we had exposure and the students in the class that um, I teach now, um, which uh, is all about history of knowledge, but in integrates um, uh, about six hands-on experiences in the lab and with pigments and molds and bread making and other kinds of things. Um, and one of them is sitting right there. <laughs> and uh, so, so that, you know, it's, it is an apprenticeship because we have to learn from each other. And I try to provide and this was something that, you know, I think is well known by, you know, people who actually study pedagogy and, you know, theorize about it. Um, and rather than just kind of doing it un, um, uh, without much background, um, that, you know, if you have kind of little more experienced and novice practitioners, um, that if you have the more experienced ones teach the novice, you know, it very much consolidates the knowledge of the more experienced and helps the, you know, um, the novice model their their work. And um, it's super effective, you know. I mean, it's just uh, in our paleography workshops, we had, oh, many pale paleography workshops, and we always paired novices and experts together. Um, and um, that was, you know, it was incredible. Um, so to provide a framework in which that can happen, um, you have to have this collective. And it's, um, it's yes, it's a very different way of doing the humanities, not so much doing the sciences. Um, so that's also an important thing to realize. Um, and, uh, I'm, I, I just think it's such a valuable lesson for so many humanities and social science students, um, or historians anyway, history students. Um, and it's interesting to see that it, it was so interesting to see the differences between the students, um, who come into the class with a, um, science background or who are um, majoring in a science. Um, and also, you know, to get together, for example, a chemist and an, and an um, archeologist to talk about the difference between lab notes and field notes, because the students have to take field notes and lab notes on their, on their work. And, oh, that was, I mean, it's just like eye opening for us as well as for the students. So, you know, it just becomes this nonstop you know, unceasing process of everybody learning at the same time. <laughs> so, which I love. Um, okay, so that was, um, I hope that sort of got to your question. Um, so I would not by any means claim that that the, the history that I tell in this book is a universal history. I mean, I do think that human bodies interacting with the material world for survival for, you know, 
beyond survival um, for making things is an interaction that happens um, everywhere. I do think that that is, I mean, I guess a universal experience, although, you know, environments are so different that it's never going to be absolutely universal in a kind of strict sense. Um, the story of craft knowledge being written down is a very Western story. And I'm not claiming that it's anything but European. Um, it's interesting that there are techniques. I mean, in the book that you um, mentioned, um, practices, knowledges, and techniques across Eurasia, 800 to 1800, in that um, edited volume, what I really wanted to show was some of the long-term movement of this, um, of this knowledge that is not written down. And, but the interesting thing is that, you know, there is, I think, this repository, this reservoir of craft knowledge that just comes to the surface every once in a while in writing. And so those are the moments at which say economic historians or um, you know, uh, historians of technology say, oh, that's when it was discovered. Now the writing is often done by an elite person. And so you know, a lot of those discoveries are attributed to elite people when they were actually known by many, many um, people and they just did them and, and um, so, so I wanted to show in that edited volume that there, that this is, you know, this is the, this is like underneath, um, you know, across all of Eurasia, there are techniques being passed around and going back and forth. And every once in a while they come up in writing and you can see how they actually come up in writing and their, their materials are understood differently in different places, in different contexts in different cities, they they have different meanings. They're not called the same thing there. So that points to both the kind of underlying movement of materials and techniques and you know people who carry them, um, especially across Eurasia and over the very, very long durée and um, that, but at the same time, they emerge every once in a while and they mean different things. It's very particular. So I hope that gets at some of the background of your question. Thank you, Pamela. Thank you, everybody.